Thank you very much for your applause. I'm sure that Professor Caspi felt the radio effects of, your, of the audience here while she's making her recovery in Canada. And now we are going to move to the, our second speaker before the break. And uh, I would call my colleague, Professor Claudia Cavadas, to present uh, Professor Sir Fraser Stoddart, who will be our next and face-to-face -face speaker. Wow, what a, what a moment. So good morning, everyone. Uh, it's really a pleasure uh, to be here with you to present you, Professor Stoddart, next speaker. So let me put my... Uh, so, in fact, um, so Professor James Fraser Stoddart is president of the direct board of the World Cultural Council uh, and received in 2016 the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his pioneering research on supramolecular chemistry and molecular machines. Professor Fraser Stoddart received other numerous awards for his work. Namely, in 2007, he was awarded with Albert Einstein World Award of Science. Professor Fraser Studat has a long and outstanding international scientific career with more than 1,000 scientific papers dedicated to chemistry. Professor James Fraser was born in Edinburgh, uh, in UK, but I'm not going to describe his outstanding and inspirational life and career because we will have the opportunity to listen to his conference entitled Around the World in 80 Years. But I would like this opportunity to highlight only, only two major contributions of Professor uh, Fraser Stoddart. One major contribution, so the first one, Professor Fraser Stoddart dedicated decades to produce new knowledge in the field of chemistry and generally to fundamental or basic science as so important as chemistry. We do know that basic science are vital to attain sustainable development and to improve the quality of life for people all over the world. The achievements of fundamental sciences should be better communicated to everyone. That's why this year, from uh, July 2022 to July 2023, the UNESCO uh, recognized this is the year of international year of basic science for sustainable that recognize the relevance of fundamental sciences. So thank you, Professor Fraser Studat, for your contribution to chemistry, a fundamental or a basic science. The second major contribution that I would like to emphasize and acknowledge, Professor Fraser Studat has been promoting science around the world and helping other researchers. And the numbers, the round numbers are really incredible. During these this 50 years of career, Professor Fraser Studat helped or mentored or supervised more than 500 early researchers from maybe 50 different countries. So Professor Fraser Studat helped those researchers to cultivate their independence and unique strengths. So the Nobel laureate Sir Fraser Studat used to say this, let me read. Science that changed the world is a product of investing time in being a good mentor to young researchers and encouraging them to think outside of the box. So again, thank you, Professor Fraser Stoddard, for your time and contribution to science and to inspire new generation of sciences. Maybe some of them are here already. So the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Diaz. Good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be standing up here at the podium. And my first uh, very pleasant duty is to thank uh, Vice President, uh, or Vice Rector, um, I should correct myself, uh, Claudia Cavados for her uh, very uh, inspired introduction. Uh, I would also like to take the opportunity to uh, thank uh, the uh, people behind the scenes here at the University of Queenborough for putting on 
this absolutely spectacular show in a stupendous setting. I also would like to extend my uh, congratulations to the uh, three uh, 2022 uh, <coughs> WCC World Cultural Council uh, laureates. All of you, my congratulations, very well done. Uh, we've heard one talk. I look forward to hearing the other two talks. And I am also, I think, honored that I'm sharing this podium today with uh, a fellow Nobel laureate in physics, uh, Professor David Gross from the University of uh, Santa Barbara. Okay, so I'm going to start my story uh, around the world in 80 days. Your patience, uh, take two. I hope it does work now. Here we go. So um, the story begins uh, in 1942, the middle of World War II. Uh, I am taken at the age of uh, six months to this uh, remote farm, uh, farmhouse, uh, about 12 miles south of the capital of Scotland, namely Edinburgh. And here is the view that uh, I uh, cherish from my bedroom window. Uh, I just want to point out that that's a horse trough. This is my father and a sheep dog. Um, there was a huge transformation during the 25 years that I spent on this farm. Uh, we went from horses and carts to uh, tractors and combine harvesters. Um, so down on the farm, uh, I was an only child, highly supportive parents. Uh, they sacrificed a lot for my schooling. Uh, we had no electricity until I was going to university at 18. It was a mixed arable farm, but we were free to run wild, to uh, invent games, to uh, risk taking was encouraged. Uh, thank you. Um, of course, being on a farm, one learned to uh, work, and uh, there was always good reward, good food for effort. Now, um, I went to a village school for some four years. It was one of those schools where there was one schoolmistress uh, for the whole of the uh, uh, school. We were five when I went, we were 28 when I left to go to this college in Edinburgh, where I had a great general education. Uh, I have to say terrific teachers, uh, pillar box red uniforms with black trim, uh, sports were emphasized, and there was also some army training. The subjects that uh, I was uh, exposed to included all of these ones, uh, and also some music into the bargain. In 1960, after 10 years at school, I went to Edinburgh University and studied chemistry, taking my uh, PhD degree, uh, having studied a uh, uh, <coughs> natural product called gum arabic from the Sudan, uh, its structure thereof, and there was a small research group I was part of, uh, and you can see quite a handsome young man on the right-hand side there. Um, my professor, uh, when I left in February of uh, 1967 to go to Canada, uh, his last parting words were, Stoddard, whatever you do, identify a big problem. And I was a bit uh, confused. I wasn't quite sure what he had in mind. So I take off to Canada. Uh, via Montreal uh, to Kingston, Ontario, and uh, arrive and join a somewhat larger group. And here is my mentor uh, at uh, postdoctoral level, uh, Ken Jones. Uh, he announced within uh, a very short time of my arrival that he was going to Brazil, uh, to Curitiba. And uh, 
I assumed, well, this would be for a couple of weeks, but no, this was for one whole year. So he disappeared, and the Canadian Postal Service went on strike, uh, so we had very, very little uh, communication, and I was left to do my own thing uh, and search for that big problem. And <clears throat> I was very lucky because within six weeks of arriving, I went to the um, chemistry library and uh, I stumbled across a paper by someone that I had never heard of, Charles Paterson. You'll see he was to share the 1987 Nobel Prize with Donald Cram from UCLA and Jean-Marie Lane from uh, Strasbourg. But in this uh, very short uh, communication, uh, <coughs> Paterson described the synthesis of a very uh, unusual compound at the time. It was an 18-membered ring with um, <coughs> 12 carbons and six oxygens. And I had been uh, instructed at Edinburgh by my undergraduate teachers to forget about making rings any bigger than six, seven, uh, and so forth. So this was uh, maybe my big problem that uh, I was uh, encouraged to tackle by Professor Hurst. And so uh, <coughs> I get going uh, in my own way at the research uh, in Canada. And, and here is a compound, it's called alpha-cyclodextrin. Uh, microbiologically, it can be obtained in ton quantities from starch, effectively from uh, corn that grows in the middle of America, and is very inexpensive. Uh, it's a circular compound. Treat it with four reagents uh, was one of the first things I did. I should say, in chemical parlance, it has uh, eight, uh, uh, sorry, it has six times five stereogenic centers. Uh, so that, that's 30. And these uh, four reactions wipe out all chirality, all handedness. It has no optical activity. And it's a very large ring. 30 in size with 12 uh, oxygens. It didn't do anything, but it introduced me to uh, a field that became known as supramolecular chemistry. Before I left uh, uh, Queen's University to return to the UK in 1970, uh, and this book was published in 1971, uh, I had started to write it when I was at Queen's and uh, I finished it at Sheffield. Um, one of the eminent stereochemists of the day, Ernest Eliel, uh, then at Chapel Hill at the University of North Carolina, was a great supporter. He read the uh, whole manuscript, covered it with red ink, and saved my bacon. Um, <clears throat> however, the professor that uh, I met in organic chemistry at Sheffield uh, did not turn out to be so supportive, uh, and I eventually worked out that uh, he was probably resentful. Um, I shouldn't be writing books. So it was a rather difficult time. Um, I didn't see my first graduate student until 72. Uh, teaching was not easy. It was a stressful existence. Uh, but I did begin doing some research. And that research involved uh, the marriage of, again, carbohydrates. This is glucose here. Uh, and here, uh, <coughs> with uh, the crown ethers that uh, Charles Paterson had introduced into the chemistry literature. And uh, this marriage between crown ethers and carbohydrates, um, despite the fact that I was not having uh, a wonderful time at Sheffield, uh, didn't uh, end up by uh, quelling my enthusiasm for chemistry. You can see that I'm a Two daughters here, uh, Fiona and Alison, uh, six and three, are standing in the middle of an 18 crown six with a carbohydrate on the side and a potassium ion in the middle. Um, so uh, here I was uh, building sandcastles uh, on the beach at Edinburgh. Uh, so this period came to an end uh, around 1978, I wrote up uh, a review, and uh, the one quote that uh, I want to bring to your attention is one from uh, Nobel laureate 
1975, uh, Vladimir uh, Prelog, chemistry um, differs. Maybe I have to go to read this carefully. I'm sorry about that. It's too far away. Um, All right, chemistry takes a unique position among the natural sciences for it deals not only with material from natural sources but creates the major part of its objects by synthesis. In this respect, the potential of its creativity is terrifying. So uh, that was the take of uh, Vladimir Prelog, which I uh, totally agree with. And so does Marcel and Bertolo back in uh, <coughs> 1860. Uh, who, who uh, made the comment that chemistry creates its own object. Now, um, let's go on and uh, appreciate that uh, in research at Sheffield in this first period, uh, I'd married crown ethers with carbohydrates. Uh, I think I'd learned to be imaginative. Uh, I met the other uh, major influence in my life from UCLA, Donald Cram in New York in 19. Uh, 76. Uh, he turned out to be incredibly supportive, um, so much so that I spent three months at UCLA in uh, the early part of 1978, and he helped me arrange to leave academia and go into uh, industry, Imperial Chemical Industries, uh, corporate laboratory in Runcorn, Cheshire, in the west of England, for uh, three years. Uh, this uh, move turned out to be um, not just a relief from uh, what was not a very pleasant department, uh, it was a breath of fresh air. I was surrounded by talented scientists, uh, the laboratory was extremely well equipped, the spirit was one of collaboration, uh, I joined a group called the Catalysis Group, uh, met a few people including Howard Cohoon that I'll introduce you to, um, took up an area that uh, we kind of invented called second sphere coordination, and that led to the use of uh, two wipeout wheat killers uh, that uh, were marketed worldwide as a 50-50 mixture, um, much of them coming to the United States to uh, remove uh, the green from uh, potatoes in Idaho before they were um, as it were, uh, harvested. Uh, another person I met was a first-class crystallographer from Imperial College London. And belatedly, I learned some management skills at the university. So uh, looking at this uh, area of second sphere coordination, the master of first sphere coordination was a Swiss chemist, uh, Alfred Werner. He was a Nobel laureate in uh, 1913, um, and one of his disciples in uh, the UK was a man called Joseph Chat, and here's a little bit of uh, Chat's philosophy, since scientific di discovery is not yet predictable, so he tells us, if you have an exciting road to follow, do not be put off by those who say there is nothing at the end of it, they do not know, persevere and enjoy the excitement of exploring the unknown. And that's exactly what we did. Uh, here is Howard and here is David and the graduate student in London that uh, brought about this transformation in um, second sphere coordination. And what do I mean by that? Well, these blue L1s was what Werner brought to the world. Uh, what we added on were weaker interactions, the red L2s around the um, uh, outer sphere of uh, a transition metal. And the um, X-ray crystal structure you see here, the yellow is platinum, um, the uh, ligands that are pointing down are two ammonium ligands, and there's a bipyridine in the uh, upper half of the uh, uh, <coughs> uh, ball and stick representation. 
And you can see how beautifully uh, it turns out that something called dibenzo 30 crown 10 wraps itself around this transition metal complex. Uh, there's some other renderings of uh, our discovery in the period of 1981, and uh, it didn't take much imagination to remove the platinum and uh, take up uh, the uh, challenge of uh, complexing diquat, the first of the two um, wipeout weed colors that uh, I am uh, drawing your attention to that were presented to us effectively on a plate because of uh, my presence at uh, ICI. Um, <clears throat> I had uh, intended to stay in industry, but uh, Imperial in uh, Chemical Industries started to uh, fold up uh, about 1981, and so I had little option but to go back to the uh, chemistry department at Sheffield. Uh, little had changed, uh, but I was more mature. I was able to handle um, much of what was going on with growing confidence. And um, while I found little support uh, locally for uh, trying to do something about uh, uh, a <coughs> department that was not working well, I criticized the system nationally, and that did not uh, win me many uh, friends uh, or, or supporters. Another thing that did not win me many friends was I hired uh, foreign students from other parts of Europe, uh, from Italy in the first instance, uh, here in Portugal, Spain, and so forth. And this was uh, frowned upon by uh, the senior people at uh, Sheffield in the chemistry department. But I did find, nonetheless, supporters, and research thrived, and uh, it set the stage for uh, breaking into a branch of uh, chemistry that we called mechanically interlocked molecules. And so this involved the introduction of a brand new bond into chemistry called the mechanical bond. And if I make the point that probably thousands of chemical compounds are made in uh, laboratories all over the world every day, maybe a dozen new chemical reactions are invented every year, but it's only once in a blue moon that a new chemical bond comes on the scene. And so we were privileged to be able to uh, participate in that uh, advance. And our first so-called catenane, which I'll describe to you in a minute, was uh, published in 1989. Uh, my late wife and I ran many conferences, but come 1990, for various reasons, I was ready to leave Sheffield. Um, before I go to my next port of call, uh, I want to point out that we had uh, complexed uh, diquat, one of these uh, bipyridinium-based uh, wipeout weed killers with uh, dibenzo uh, 30 crown 10. Uh, we had failed to uh, complex paraquat, uh, which you see on the uh, left-hand side here. And uh, eventually, after spending a lot of time uh, that did not add up to very much, we um, found that uh, a compound called BPP34C10, which is an acronym for bisparaphenylene 34 crown 10. So it's a 34-membered ring with, again, 10 oxygens. It's a constitutional isomer of dibenzo 30 crown 10, and it uh, bound paraquat very well. Having put red in, uh, blue inside red, we had to find out how to put red inside blue. So there followed the uh, design and synthesis of what became known as our little blue box. And <clears throat> while the crown ether complexed uh, being pi electron rich with pi electron deficient uh, guest species, the uh, uh, little blue box being pi electron deficient complexed with pi electron rich uh, uh, guests. And so here you see a movie of uh, paraquat finding its way inside the bisparaphenylene 34 crown 10. Um, we were able to uh, then use the information that uh, templation was important to make the little blue box 
in high yield. And so you'll see that this red component uh, acts as a template around which the uh, blue ring builds itself. And what you've been looking at is uh, the um, run-up to us being able to use this chemistry to uh, make mechanical bonds. And the two uh, best known um, mechanically interlocked molecules are um, the catenane on the left and the rituxane on the right. The catenane is an example of two interlocked rings, minimally, can be many more, and a rituxane is a dumbbell with big, big stoppers with at least one ring in the middle. And uh, <coughs> that uh, uh, could be summarized, as I say, the two of them as being examples of mechanically interlocked molecules, or MIMS. And the names are derived from Latin, in the case of the rituxane, as you can see there, and also um, Latin in the case of the catenane. So um, <clears throat> we were set up by the end of the 80s uh, to uh, use what I call donor acceptor uh, templation. That is the uh, weak interactions between a acceptor, the blue component, and a donor, the red component. And if we mix these together in acetonitrile at room temperature, then um, we got our, um, I guess, uh, big moment, uh, our microwave moment, if I can just play back to the uh, previous talk. Uh, we obtained a two catenane in amazing 70% yield. This represented a jump from 1% to 70% overnight for uh, making an all organic um, catenane. And it appeared in the uh, cover of Angavante Chemie in the October of 1989. Uh, here is a movie showing you how it comes together. So the ring, the red one, acts as a template for the making of the blue ring. Um, the interesting thing is that the interactions between the red and the blue live on in the two rings uh, after they've been made. And so we could use um, uh, proton NMR that's nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy to detect rocking, uh, pirouetting, and also circumrotation, all occurring at different rates. The first fast and the last one relatively slow. Uh, here's a photograph of uh, the person that uh, introduced me to uh, UCLA, uh, Don Cram and his wife Jane and my late wife Norma at a meeting, a big one, uh, in Sheffield in 1991. So what happened after uh, the, uh, the 80s? I moved to uh, Birmingham University in 1990, uh, and I was there for seven years. I had been headhunted, uh, despite the fact that I was uh, a, a big critic of the British system. Uh, they put a big investment into literally saving their chemistry department, which had fallen on bad times, uh, and I became a professor at the age of 48. Now, I had excellent students, most of them coming from other European countries and Asia, and even America, uh, new laboratories, state-of-the-art equipment, and research really blossomed, and we uh, described our first <coughs> so-called molecular shuttle in 1991, followed by a molecular switch in 1994. Um, another uh, breakthrough was a five-membered catenane, uh, which we called Olympiadane, for obvious reasons, in 96. And during my last four years at uh, Birmingham, I was head of the School of Chemistry. Change was dynamic. And just to give you an academic tree, um, <coughs> Birmingham had... Uh, had a glorious past in carbohydrate chemistry in particular, thanks to the uh, uh, <coughs> creativity of uh, Sir Walter Norman uh, Haworth, who was a Nobel laureate, uh, the first British organic chemistry to be honored in Stockholm um, in 1937 for his synthesis of vitamin C and uh, work on polysaccharides. And you can see that uh, his training took him back into 
the heydays of German organic chemistry. Um, <clears throat> and after a couple of people, uh, my mentor in Edinburgh and the Queens, uh, of course, uh, I fell in love with uh, the, uh, or fell foul of the uh, medal that um, the others uh, earlier on in my lineage had received. Um, now to the chemistry again, a degenerate tour attaxane, uh, I call it, was uh, described in 91 uh, using the same principles that uh, had been employed to make the catenane, and the weak interactions were exactly the same. Weak hydrogen bonding, um, <coughs> donor acceptor interactions, uh, even weaker and extremely weak uh, so-called CH pi interactions. This time, the uh, yield of the first reaction uh, was about half that of the um, catenane because it's a less organized system. Although I should add that both of these nowadays can be made in quantitative yields. And again, you will see this uh, movie that shows how the little blue box clips itself around a dumbbell. Once you have the dumbbell, you can watch the um, ring move back and forth uh, by again NMR spectroscopy, and it does so in acetone solution about 2,000 times a second. And this molecular shuttle, uh, which again you see in the movie here, uh, was the first step towards uh, forecasting what was to come next. And so in our 91 uh, Jack's paper, we described uh, in four sentences at the end uh, what lay before us. And uh, this uh, second sentence I want to quote to you because the then um, editor of the Journal of the American Chemical Society prevailed on us to remove all of uh, these comments uh, claiming they were hype. So let me just read insofar as it becomes possible to control the movement of one molecular component with respect to the other in a tour attack saying the technology for building molecular machines um, will emerge. This was the first time that I had mentioned the uh, two words, molecular machines. So it was, uh, I think, uh, a good thing to do, to, to stick to one's guns and not be uh, <coughs> dissuaded from uh, advertising what one layer, what, what was in, in the future for us. So the next step was to desymmetrize the uh, two rotaxane uh, so that you can see the little blue box again jumping between a green unit, which happens to be called uh, um, benzidine, uh, to uh, a red one called biphenol. And it spends 84% uh, of its time on the green unit and 16% on the red unit. However, you can eventually uh, and here you see it shuttling back and forth, more time on the green unit than on the red unit. At, uh, quickly, you can change the whole scene by adding some acid, and that protonates the nitrogens of the uh, benzidine unit, and columbic repulsion sends the uh, blue box entirely to the red unit. And so now we have a switch that is uh, controlled by uh, acid base, that is by pH. And uh, here you see that in motion uh, between a charged unit when it goes to that uh, sort of brownish color and a neutral unit on the left-hand side when it goes green. Um, I mentioned this five catenane previously. Uh, this was another feat of synthesis, putting five rings together. And you can see that I've picked them out in the um, colors of the Olympic sign, our Olympic uh, logo. Uh, here's a ball and stick representation, and here's a simplified uh, interpretation of the weak interactions that uh, uh, <coughs> are present, uh, pi pi, CHO, and CH pi interactions in this uh, particular five category. In other words, it's not just five rings linked to each other willy-nilly. They're all speaking to each other in a very, very subtle way. Uh, there's another representation of uh, this uh, compound, Olympiadine. 
which was published in 1997. Uh, you can see that uh, the group at Birmingham was already very international at a glance. Uh, I can see Italians, Indians, Russians, Hungarians, French, um, and so on, Germans, um, and so it goes on. This was game changing, and of course it breaks my heart today that um, that country that uh, was uh, England's second biggest city uh, residing therein has, um, as it were, closed its door, roughly speaking to uh, the influx of uh, people from overseas. Forget about the effect on the economy and all the rest of it, the way it has damaged the lives of young people. I cannot forgive the politicians in England for doing this uh, dastardly act. So, sorry, I get quite emotional about this topic. Um, so come 1997, I had had several offers to move to the States, particularly to UCLA, and <clears throat> for a reason I'll come to in a minute, I did move um, uh, at the age of 55 to um, uh, Los Angeles. Uh, changing academic systems presented a very steep learning curve, but I now had extremely supportive colleagues uh, and collaborations were um, very much encouraged. And for a period I became the director of the California uh, Nanosystems Institute, which uh, straddled both UCLA and Santa Barbara. It was a highly productive time. There was much traveling, but um, I lost my wife in 2004. Um, she had uh, met uh, with breast cancer in um, 1992, and so for uh, 12 years of uh, a third of our married life, uh, we were fighting that insidious disease. Um, and, and it was not, of course, a very pleasant time. Uh, <clears throat> and it encouraged me later to enter the field of drug delivery systems. I won't talk about those. I will just uh, make a comment about uh, a collaboration with uh, an amazing um, physical chemist, uh, uh, James Heath, Jim Heath, who's now um, the director of uh, the uh, Systems Biology uh, Institute up in um, Seattle. And uh, together with Jim, uh, during a decade, uh, and this nature paper in 2007 was, uh, I guess, the peak of our achievement, we put together a 160 kilobit molecular RAM based on a two rituxane switch that you see in the middle and a crossbar uh, type architecture that was the forte of Jim in producing. Uh, fabricating the crossbar device, I will skip in the interest of time because we're a bit late. Um, and we tested 128 bits um, and uh, threw three quarters of them out. Uh, there was only uh, a third, uh, sorry, a quarter of them that were really acceptable, but that was enough uh, to produce molecular random access memory at a density of 10 to the 11 bits per squint per square centimeter, which at the time was, uh, and this was 2007, remember, uh, where the uh, International Technology Roadmap for semiconductors hoped to be by 2020. So um, it was 2007, and out of the blue, I got a phone call followed by this letter from the Consul General, British Consul General in Los Angeles, which um, was, um, a fairly long story, but uh, it was the fact that uh, the Prime Minister of the day in the UK, Tony Blair, had it in mind to uh, <clears throat> recommend to Queen Elizabeth II that I uh, receive a knighthood. This, this was a, a huge surprise. It was one of these um, <clears throat> situations where uh, 
one wasn't really expecting or prepared for it. However, uh, after swearing, being sworn to secrecy uh, for uh, six weeks from the middle of November to the announcement at the end of the year, uh, there followed a ceremony, I think it was in June of 2007 at Buckingham Palace, where I met um, the uh, Queen for 15 seconds, and uh, you'll be interested to hear what uh, was said. So the Lord Chamberlain, who is in the background, his head's been chopped off, uh, said, may I present your majesty, uh, to your majesty, Professor Fraser Stoddart, for services to chemistry and nanotology. Oh my goodness. Okay, uh, so uh, I was in a cold sweat because I had this very sharp knife on my right hand shoulder. And when I got up and the looked her in the face, he, she immediately said he got that wrong, didn't he? Uh, that was a big relief. Uh, so my retort was, he certainly did, your majesty. Um, and she came back, what should it be then? And she got it right, nanotechnology. Good on her. Um, <clears throat> Uh, you've got it right, ma'am. So, um, having told her that, uh, she came back with, it's about very small things, isn't it? Uh, so, I agreed with her on that, uh, saying that it was a hundred thousand times, hundred thousand times smaller than the diameter of a human hair. That's exceedingly small. And she'd obviously done her homework. She said, you work in America now, I'm told. And uh, I agreed. And that was the end of our 15-second uh, uh, <coughs> meeting. I was on my merry way. So it was around this time that uh, I left uh, the UCLA uh, campus and uh, moved to Northwestern, where I am now. Uh, again, blessed with terrific students, great colleagues. Uh, as a result of these interactions, lots of publications were flowing and still do. Um, loads of uh, financial support, uh, too many invited lectures maybe, uh, and fellowship of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the National Academy of Sciences, the Chinese Academy of Sciences, you name it, the Australian one. Um, and I served on the honors committee and still do at uh, Northwestern in chemistry. Uh, we produced a second book and uh, also uh, brought in uh, to being two startup companies. And uh, I got um, quite involved in philanthropy, which I'll come back to in a minute. Um, the second book um, on the nature of the mechanical bond um, is a, a six chapter book. Uh, I don't have time to go through all the details. Uh, it's over 600 pages in length, and uh, it is very much uh, the heavy lifting was done by an amazing uh, graduate student who postdoc with me for a period while he wrote the book uh, before going to um, uh, the University of Colorado to his assistant professorship. Um, the startups that uh, I would like to mention briefly are very, very different. One. Uh, was based on uh, the use of this compound cyclodextrin and second sphere coordination to complex uh, gold in the form of tetrabromoorate uh, as its potassium salt. Uh, this is a complex that uh, appears within uh, minutes of mixing it up in water, and so it's uh, ideal for uh, the isolation of uh, gold. And uh, one of my former graduate students from my days in Sheffield um, <coughs> Roger Petman is the chairman and CEO of the company, and uh, it is thriving now, having spent time in Nevada at uh, the whiskey mine in uh, Arizona. The other uh, startup company is a skincare company coming out of uh, what I call Bob's Your Uncle chemistry. That's a good British phrase. You take a spoonful of sugar, this is a cyclodextrin again, a pinch of salt, uh, better be a potassium salt rather than a sodium one, uh, potassium chloride, and a swig of alcohol, and Bob's your uncle. You get this very highly extended structure, and uh, this has led to the establishment of a 
skincare company called Noble Panacea, uh, which uh, launched just before the onset of the pandemic at the New York Museum of Modern Art in October of uh, 2019. And uh, that was an evening I will never forget, being surrounded by um, a whole different uh, panoply of uh, uh, <coughs> stars of uh, stage and screen that uh, I'm not normally in the company of. It was very interesting. Um, <coughs> and this has led uh, also to an increased uh, interest in philanthropy. And this is very uh, uh, pertinent today because in the United States, uh, this is called Giving Tuesday. And uh, I am uh, involved in the support of the American Chemical Society Project SEED, which uh, I started championing back in 2018 uh, when they were at their 50th year of uh, being in uh, uh, <coughs> action. And uh, this program actually supports uh, young high school students from underprivileged backgrounds to explore chemistry in uh, university and college environments during the summer with dedicated mentors. So um, if I disappear a little today, it's because I will be uh, doing something in support of this uh, so-called Project SEED. Um, now back to uh, the science. Um, I'm watching my clock, but uh, we're a little late and uh, I better keep going. So the grand challenge, going fast forward to 2012, uh, I would describe as artificial molecular switches are a dime a dozen. Artificial molecular machines, on the other hand, are few and far between because machines need to perform work on their immediate environments. Uh, assembling and controlling synergistically uh, AMMs, as I call them, uh, housed in highly interactive and robust architectural domains, heralds a game changer for chemical synthesis and a defining moment for nanofabrication. And some of the background here is that uh, we're back with these bipyridinium herbicides, um, or the units, the bipyridinium unit in these herbicides, that uh, we had kind of ignored uh, up until 2010. Uh, there was plenty of literature that told us otherwise, that we should have been more active uh, from uh, Germany, from Switzerland, uh, sorry, Germany, Israel, and uh, South Korea. Um, but uh, eventually, one of my uh, brilliant postdocs uh, said, let's take the little blue box and methylviologin and kill half of the positive charges and make three so-called radical cations. Is it possible that the radicals would win out over the Coulombic repulsion of the positive charges? And the answer was, yes, it did, in a spectacular kind of way. And this uh, so-called radically enhanced now molecular recognition left us with uh, a very powerful way of building molecular machines. So if I define some icons, um, <coughs> locks with keys uh, on and off, uh, fairly obvious, templation, which you've seen already. Uh, radical recognition is uh, associated with the color purple. Remember, I've used blue before for um, uh, acceptor units and red for rich pi electron units. Now the radicals are purple. Um, we can use heat, uh, that's important, in driving our machines, or we can use electricity, and uh, we can have different ratios, and we can use pH. And so now you see in 2010 what was discovered was that if we reduced uh, the little blue box to a bis radical um, dicatine and the methyl biologin, uh, the paraquat to a radical cation, then uh, the radicals won out and the um, complex was formed. Uh, this was uh, used to some extent with uh, a so-called energy ratchet that we designed in 2013, where um, 
we did use the donor acceptor red-blue interactions to begin with, and uh, then formed the radical which killed the molecular recognition between the red and blue. And the important thing about this work is that it demonstrates unidirectional motion of the ring with respect to the dumbbell. Um, a few years later, 2015, this led to, sorry, the uh, design and synthesis of a molecular pump where you see the uh, blue box uh, overcoming ultimately in the oxidation phase a green speed bump. The uh, box is brought on uh, by reduction and pushed onto a collecting chain under oxidative conditions. And as you do this, you raise the energy of the whole system in a quite remarkable way. Uh, it also led to the design of what was called a molecular dual pump, where uh, the collecting chain in the middle uh, was such that we could isolate a compound, and this is therefore a two rotaxane, because it's one ring and one dumbbell, and then use reduction and oxidation to push it off the other end. Um, <clears throat> the next one was a molecular druid pump where we put what we now call the pumping cassette on the end of uh, a chain-like molecule with 36 uh, methylene groups and a couple of uh, charged ammonium groups, uh, enough to accommodate uh, two rings after uh, reduction and oxidation to uh, push four rings in total onto a uh, dumbbell, and that is four plus one, a uh, five rotaxane. Uh, more recently, in the last couple of years, we've gone as far as to take a polymer, which is polyethylene glycol, a well-known polymer, and put pumping cassettes on the end of it, and add two, and then four, and then six, and then eight, and then 10, and ultimately, the limit is 12 rings on in a very precise manner. Um, and here's another movie showing you that only two come on simultaneously from each end. And uh, we can follow all of this uh, by, um, again, nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Um, and most recently, uh, we've uh, converted the uh, long um, dumbbell into a loop and used, uh, and we need to use two rings, uh, starting at three o'clock and nine o'clock and under reduction going to 12 o'clock and six o'clock and then on oxidation coming back to three o'clock and nine o'clock. So that's a 180 degree movement. And if we carry out this redox chemistry twice, we can uh, have um, the rings rotate through 360 degrees, and so this is an electric motor. We are anticipating that it will be published about the 12th of January in Nature. Um, so to summarize um, this journey in terms of uh, molecular shuttles, 91, molecular switches, 94, uh, molecular machines, 2015 and onwards, um, these are some of the uh, main players on the left and the right. Uh, very, very talented people and uh, some collaborators, including uh, Bill Goddard, you can see down on the uh, right-hand side at the very bottom. And, uh, oh yes, and I should mention uh, physicist Dina Stumian at the University of Maine. As far as I'm concerned, Dina Stumian walks on water. There is no physicist that I know in the world who understands the way that biomotors and artificial molecular motors work than does Dean. Um, so I pose this question for the young people, what if? Hearst had not challenged me to tackle a big problem. Jones had not gone to Brazil immediately after I arrived in Canada on the 1st of March, 67. Peterson had not introduced crown ethers into chemistry in the April of 67. I had not gone to the ICI corporate lab in 78. I had not met Calhoun and Williams around the topic of second sphere coordination. 
ICI had not been marketing Nyquat and Parkport as wipeout weed, weed killers, there would have been no blue box, uh, no catenane, and probably no molecular shuttle. Um, my wife's ill health had not taken me to UCLA to the Winstein Chair of Chemistry in 97, and I had not met uh, Heath, that should not be health, sorry, sorry about that, Heath and introduced molecular switches into molecular electronics. Uh, the California uh, Nanosystem Institute had not become, this, this was the reason I moved to Northwestern, a bit of a white elephant from lack of uh, financial support. Um, and I therefore moved to Northwestern. Uh, my research group had not been visited by serendipity at least twice. There would not have been a couple of startup companies. I had not been surrounded by supportive colleagues and brilliant students at, well, UCLA, Birmingham, uh, Northwestern, and even going back to the later days at Sheffield. I had not received support in the US from uh, leading chemists such as Ernest Elio, Kurt Mislow, Donald Cram, David Gutscher, and so on, and in Germany from Helmut Ringsdorf, and in Italy from Vincenzo Balzani. So here are some of the leading molecular machinists of the day. My, um, let's go back, two uh, co-laureates in 16, Nobel laureate uh, um, Jean-Pierre Sauvage from, uh, Pierre Sauvage from uh, Strasbourg, uh, Ben Ferenga from Groningen in the Netherlands, and uh, many other people in Italy, um, David Lee in Manchester, again, Dina Stumian, uh, Steve Loeb in Canada, uh, Joseph Miko, uh, now in the Czech Republic, uh, Eddie Sebek at the ANU in Australia, uh, Mexican, um, Miguel Garcia Garibay, now Dean of Science at UCLA, uh, Paul by uh, birth, uh, Raphael Klein at the Weizmann Institute, New Zealander, Amar Flood at Indiana University, and uh, Ivan Aprahamian at Dartmouth College, and Nicholas. Giusponi, and these are just a few of the uh, new stars on the scene in molecular machine uh, uh, science. A few marks, remarks from Jean-Pierre Sauvage. Um, importance of novelty over everything else. Interacting with other scientists within your group uh, or outside is essential. Trust young scientists. Jumping from a field, this is what he did, which is very familiar to you, to another field can be extremely beneficial. Do not ask yourself whether you are good enough to tackle a new problem. Just do it. Encounters are determining. Um, roughly the same kind of uh, message from um, 2009, uh, Nobel Laureate in Chemistry, uh, uh, Venka Ramakrishnan. I found that almost nobody at the Molecular Biology Laboratory in Cambridge was working on routine problems just because they would lead to publishable results. Rather, they were trying to ask the most interesting questions in their field and then developing ways to address them. Again, uh, recently, at the early part of the year, I visited what was the uh, Bell Telephone uh, Laboratories and fellow Scotsman Alexander Graham Bell was held in great esteem there, and he has uh, been recorded as saying, leave the beaten track occasionally and dive into the woods. You will be certain to find something that you have never seen before. Uh, my own take on this, uh, which was published in 18, 2018 in Nature Nanotechnology, to achieve something that is impactful in contemporary science and to Single, to be singled out as a scientist who leaves their mark on science and ultimately technologies, you need to become recognized widely as having done your own thing. And uh, the goal, uh, it means, uh, this goal, that you make a very conscious decision to summon up enough courage to tackle a big problem, as I was uh, encouraged by my professor to do, from which, for which no one uh, has provided a satisfactory scientific answer. 
message tackle a big problem? Um, no. Uh, stretching my wings. So in the period from 1980 to 2022, uh, these are some of the countries that uh, I found myself visiting. Um, I think over 50. And ultimately ending up in 2016 in Sweden, in Stockholm, after receiving an early morning call from the uh, chemistry committee of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, uh, followed by this letter on the 5th of October, 2016. And uh, the uh, prize was being given to Savage, Ferenga and myself for the design and synthesis of molecular machines. The response at Northwestern, which had actually not been very kind to me during the year 2016. I was on the point of moving to Texas without going into any details. But um, the university hierarchy went through a 180 degree um, movement and signage appeared everywhere. Um, I can't go into my uh, office without going past doors with uh, pictures of myself. Um, they took the famous arch at Northwestern and uh, adorned it. We took the opportunity to capture the group at that stage on film. Uh, the so-called tech building, which is uh, the center hub for uh, chemistry, physics, uh, mathematics, uh, material science, got that banner placed across it. And most of all, um, there was this uh, urge to reserve some parking for me. Um, so I still have this parking spot to this day, but I also have a place to park a bicycle because Ben Faringa was uh, boasting in his um, lectures around the world that uh, Stoddart has this uh, parking spot for a car. I go to work on a bicycle. So uh, I took this, uh, uh, as a bit of a provocation, and I got in touch with the uh, <coughs> president of Northwestern University, and, and uh, I ended up with a bicycle parking place as well. The problem was that uh, I hadn't ridden the bicycle for many years, but uh, here you can see on the campus of Tsinghua University that uh, I can still ride a bicycle. Um, while we're in China, I had the opportunity to meet uh, former now Premier Li Qiqing. Um, and uh, this was in early January of 2017. Um, and it was reported in Chinese daily. Uh, what you might find interesting is the, the size of this photograph compared to the size of that one. Uh, atop of uh, the Microsoft building in New York City. They went to town and uh, put up uh, images of uh, my two uh, co-laureates, and I guess myself there. Um, the American Chemical Society uh, adorned the front of their uh, building in Washington with uh, the three of us. And uh, in November, before going to Stockholm, we had the opportunity of visiting the Oval Office in the White House and meeting with uh, President Obama. And then uh, in uh, December, uh, leading up to the 10th of December, we were as a family in Stockholm. And uh, on the left and right, you can see my younger daughter and my elder daughter, uh, their respective husbands, and the five grandchildren. Uh, four boys and one girl. Uh, there was the meeting with the King of Sweden, uh, the receipt of a medal, and uh, additional, uh, whatever they're called, not the, dual, not the real Mackay, but uh, 
Um, there's a name for them. Uh, there are my uh, grandchildren holding the real medal. And here is a... Uh, what a lovely speech that was. Oh, thank you, thank you. Well, oh, thank you. Well, thank you. Swedish television. With, uh, everyone and all those outside looking on. I hope so. Yes, yes. it did. So, as we can see, you got the advice to bring all the young ones to yes, Stockholm. Yes, yes. So, was this good advice? Oh, absolutely. This was terrific advice. Uh, these youngsters will remember these few days for the rest of their lives and they will, I think, probably go on with more self-esteem, more self-confidence and uh, will end up uh, being more successful in their lives as a result Future of this. Future Nobel days. laureates. <laughs> yes. What about you kids? Did you have fun? Did you have fun tonight? Oh yeah, this, this night was probably one of the best nights of my life. It was? Really? Yeah. So what was the best thing about tonight? Eating the chocolates. <laughs> do you agree? Yes. <laughs> what about you? What do uh, you say? I liked the singing. The singing was really nice. Yep. Well, thank you so much for joining us and have a wonderful rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we can go and eat chocolate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For So thank you, thank you, Professor Stoddart, for this uh, amazing presentation and inspiring. I will ask, we are a little bit late, but if there is one question from the audience, from the students, or from some professors or teachers, please, someone can ask only one question. Uh, oh, there is one question there. There is one question there. Just one. Thank you. First of all, we'll, we would like to thank you for the amazing lecture. It's been a pleasure hearing you speak. We found your presentation to be very interesting and inspiring for us as young students. We would like to ask you if you have hope for the contribution and impact that chemistry can have on the world today, especially on problems such as sustainable production of food in a way that can assure the necessities of the global the population. Answer? The impact of chemistry. Yes. Thank you. So the impact of chemistry. One okay. Idea. I gather the question, because the uh, acoustics are not so good up here, from the hall up to the podium, uh, was about the impact of chemistry. Is that the case? Well, um, without a doubt. Uh, Chemistry has a huge role uh, to play. It has played an enormously big role uh, from centuries ago up to the present day. But I put it to you that um, some of the biggest challenges that uh, we face on planet Earth today, uh, not least of all, 
um, the results of uh, fairly dramatic climate change is a problem that by and large is going to have to be and is being tackled every day by chemists. So I think the very survival of uh, planet Earth is not only exclusively, but largely in the hands of chemists. And so I think um, on that basis, I would say the impact of chemistry is only going to increase as uh, these next few years unfold. Thank you, thank you. So, thank you again. Thank you. Uh, we don't have time for more questions. I'll give the microphone to my colleague. Go, go, get them. Thank you very much for this fantastic lecture. Now we are going to stop, have a break. Uh, so, 50 minutes break, and then we'll resume for the last session of, of the morning. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>